Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about what's going on in biotech with Futures in Biotech host Mark Pelletier. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki. Episode 103, recorded Thursday, July 7th, 2011. Futures in Biotech Science Hour. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. It's episode 103, and today is the Futures in Biotech Science Hour mashup. That's right. We're bringing together the two twit science shows, and we're mashing it up with our guest, Dr. Mark Pelletier, today. It's going to be a lot of fun, so I hope that you are ready to get down and dirty for the next hour into the world of biotechnology. It's going to be great. We have so much, so much to talk about and so much to cover. And I have many questions to ask of Dr. Pelletier. But to get started, we have science headlines to start the hour. So let's get going. Whether you are ready or not, tomorrow heralds the last space shuttle launch ever, as long as the weather cooperates, which doesn't look too promising, but you can watch the simulcast of Space Vidcast's, co Vidcast's coverage here on Twit TV. So keep an eye out for at NASA.gov mission pages shuttle uh, to find out what's happening with the shuttle launch or tomorrow morning. Just check out Twit and see whether or not Shuttle Atlantis is going to make its final voyage into space. The 2012 Commerce, Justice, and Science Appropriations Bill was released. The NSF flatlined with funding, while NOAA, NIST, and NASA saw budget cuts, including a line item to cancel the James Webb Space Telescope, Hubble's budgetary and schedule overrun-ridden successor. So what's going to happen next with looking at the universe? We don't know. Rare earth elements were found by Japanese scientists in the mud of the deep sea. If mining companies can overcome technical hurdles to mining them at depth, the discovery may break China's stranglehold on the basic materials for your cell phones and laptops. Scripps Oceanav Oceanographic Research Institute scientists found that one in 10 fish, actually 9.2%, in the Pacific garbage patch, patch have eaten plastic that collects in the gyre. This is a significantly lower number than previous estimates, which suggested about 50% of the fish had eaten the plastic, but it still has frightening implications for plastics accumulating in the food chain. A leveling out of global temperatures over the past decade is due to the release of sulfates into the atmosphere by the coal burning boom in developing countries like China, suggesting that we are still in for a lot of warming trouble once they clean up their act. Bioprospectors discovered a high temperature enzyme for digesting cellulose in an extremophile, an archaebacteria found in a Nevada hot spring. The enzyme will digest cellulose at temperatures higher than the boiling point of water, about 109 degrees actually, Fahrenheit, and might prove useful in biofuel production methods. Hundreds of new species of bacteria were discovered in belly buttons, and science writer Carl Zimmer's belly button contained bacteria from soil in Japan, even though he's never been to Japan. So that's curious. Finally, according to MRI scans of people, people's brains as they looked at art, the area of the brain called the medio orbital prefrontal medio orbital cortex is active when the viewer thinks the art is beautiful. So obviously art is uh, subjective and in the brain of the beholder, 
rather than the I. That does it for the science headlines. I hope you'd enjoyed those for today. You can catch more science news discussion on This Week in Science, which airs weekly on the Twist Network at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time. And you can catch episodes of those um, on twist.org. Now into the show, we've got our guest, Dr. Mark Pelletier, to join us today. He is the co-founder and vice president, chief scientific officer of Aeromics, LLC, a biotechnology company that is developing molecules to treat cerebral edema, otherwise known as brain swelling, which occurs after stroke, traumatic injury, meningitis, and gliomas. He's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, and the host and producer of Futures in Biotech, a wonderful program here on Fridays on the TWIT Network. Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, thank you for the invitation. I think this is a, a great opportunity and it's a great honor to be on your show. Uh, yeah. As you know, um, I do watch your show. It airs at 7 p.m. here in uh, Eastern Time. So we, uh, so I always have, you know, the Dr. Kiki Science Hour up in the corner. Do I, I plan some data analysis and I run through the Excel spreadsheets. And every so often I'll uh, join the chat room, but uh, I'm a huge fan. And as a matter of fact, I'm a fan of uh, a lot of shows on the Twit Network, and that's how I kind of got involved. Uh, but it was great to have you join the network and uh, expand the general science um, aspect of it and uh, bring in uh, an audience and some momentum to the uh, to science. I think Leo has a has a has a you know a little place in his heart for science. And uh, I know he does. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. So what a, a, a fun thing to do. Hey, by the way, your Thank your you. stories. There, I had two really favorite stories. Uh, okay. On your on your headlines. Okay, so the okay. space shuttle last mission. Yes. Good riddance. My my opinion is good riddance. It's time for humans to explore the solar system. And you know, right now where the technology stands, perhaps we cannot land on Mars. We don't have the technology to do it, but let's get there. Let's go to an asteroid. Let's go to the asteroid belt, and actually put a human in a ship and fly them around. It's been uh, you know forty years since the the last great you know exit of the orbit, uh, the Earth orbit, now's the time to do it again. So no more so, uh, low Earth orbit or uh, just Earth orbiting vehicles that can land. You don't think that we should replace the space shuttle or do you think we should get something, uh, some kind of a launch vehicle that will just launch us further out into space? All of the above, mm. but to use a 30 year old technology without yeah. uh, any serious upgrade, uh, it's time. It's time to really push that uh, that envelope. You know, I in doing futures in biotech, I I do sometimes uh, do a couple of uh, I've done a couple of space shows, uh, space exploration, because I think it's a it's an element of human uh, the human nature, and and our biology. You know, we're getting to the next step of our stage of evolution, going from Earthlings to Earthlings that travel through space, and uh, Buzz. Um, so here, here's the funny story with Buzz Aldrin. I have a funny story for most of my guests. <laughs> so I um, do a sound check with Buzz Aldrin. He takes his headset off. He puts it on, the, on the, uh, the, the, the table, but he leaves the microphone on. I continue the entire recording. He goes on, uh, picks up another headset. He starts talking to JPL, you know, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, right. and starts explaining to them how to get a ship uh, into the Martian atmosphere with a heat shield, but yet still test the engines without removing the heat shield, right? So you want to test <laughs> your, your, your engines to come back up before you go down, and you've got a heat shield, and this is a problem. And he, for 25, 30 minutes, gives an extremely technical, technical. Uh, description on how to do this, and I've got it all on tape. I've kept it for myself and for my kids. But uh, then, that's, well, that's only half the story. The guy's brilliant. Clearly, the Apollo astronauts were chosen from a select few of really talented folks. Uh, then he picks up, uh, or right before picking up my headset, he tells the guy at JPL, oh, by the way, I've got an interview with Time. It was not Time, it was Twit. And he knew it. <laughs> so he, he puts it back on. And I, so I've got him saying that Mark Paltz at uh, Time, but it's not Time, it was Twit, and he knew it. <laughs> he knew it. He was just, he was just telling somebody yeah, something you, bigger. You take an individual like that. He's a scientist, right? He did his PhD at MIT yeah. in the 50s, right? 
1958, 60, after flying 66 missions in Korea, he comes back to the U.S., he decides to do a Ph.D. He does a Ph.D. in the late 50s and designs the technologies to do ship-to-ship -ship rendezvous, spaceship rendezvous in the 50s. He designs it. Then, within five years, he's on a spaceship in Gemini 12, orbiting the Earth, right, in the early 60s. So talk about a capable individual and one that's, you know, driven and inspired to do science. Um, I think Buzz Aldrin is one of my favorites uh, ever for, you know, it's like today saying, I'm going to do teleportation. I've just come back from war. I think teleportation is important. I'm going to design teleportation and in five years be doing teleportation, right? Maybe, maybe that's the... It's, that's basically what he did. Because you imagine the 50s, yeah. all there was was Sputnik flying around the Earth. And he's already designing how sp spaceships are coming together. He's, so, I'm uh, going to go to the moon. I'm going to get out of here. Yes. <laughs> and he made it. And he right. made it. Fantastic guy. One of the few people to actually make it. So, yeah. And, and he's done an amazing job to, I think, uh, push, push the the space program, push science, push engineering. He's, you know, he's a wonderful, dynamic public figure who's been, you know, out talking to people about science for, for decades. Yeah, and he'll defend it with fists. <laughs> you know, nice. people deny he went, do you see that YouTube video where he punches a guy out because he kept saying that he, he, they didn't go to the moon and he was in his face. And, and not that, uh, not that I'm, I condone punching somebody in the face because they deny the moon mission, but, but you know. the, to get so fed up with it that it, that it, that it comes to fists, it's kind of fun, funny to watch. So next story, by the way, that I thought was really cool is the thermophile okay. story. Okay, yeah, so got, I love that story. So they're, they've purified an enzyme that uh, came from a thermophile bacteria. So this is a bacteria that grows. The proteins are so in, incredibly stable that even under boiling conditions, the proteins hold their integrity, not only hold their integrity, but remain um, functionally active. Yeah, and so, explain, explain why, this is, why this is important um, and, and what the problem is uh, with heat in, for most proteins. Well... What happens as soon as you heat, uh, for example, human protein above 37 degrees Celsius, right, or 97.7, 98.6, the enzyme starts to untwist. So an enzyme is a protein, and uh, proteins are made of chains of amino acids. And while they sit as, you know, uh, chains or like a, you might think of a, a rosary, you know, uh, uh, like a Catholic rosary, uh, the beads which make up the amino acids, they do nothing as a string. If they're stretched out as a string, they become egg on a dish after a dishwasher, right? You know, you have to scrape it and it's hard as a rock. Yeah. Um, and that causes protein folding disease. It can be the, the, the reason for protein folding diseases if it happens in your brain. But nevertheless, if a, uh, you heat them, they just fall apart. The, 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 the chains fall apart. The, to function, they have to have a very, very, very unique confirmation where the, the amino acids interplay and the electrostatic interactions, the van der Waals interactions, the hydrogen bonding create an electron cloud that is coherent that uh, a, a compound, a small molecule or uh, something like cellulose, which is a large uh, sugar chain, can fit in and zip through and get processed, cut by uh, chemical interactions. So um, you've got heat, heat destroys that. And, uh, but here's what I thought was particularly interesting is how do you purify or make a, an enzyme that's uh, thermophilic? How would you go about purifying it? So like the, the enzyme that's used in polymerase chain reaction to amplify mm -hmm. DNA where you boil a sample 30 times for, uh, for a minute. Well, what you do is all you, you take a non-thermophile bacteria E. coli, something very, very simple, a little workhorse in the lab. You throw the gene in for the thermophilic enzyme, and then you make it makes the protein inside the cell, and you have oh, about 2,000 different kinds of proteins in the bacteria. You boil the sample and spin down the goo. <laughs> the supernatant <laughs> is stable, and it's your purified enzyme. So it's a single-step purification process. So one might think that while well, having a thermophilic enzyme that can process cellulose and chop the sugar molecules into gasoline length octane, you know, dodeca, dodeca uh, mm -hmm. uh, polymers, you know, and, and have it stable for the whole, um, uh, you know, 
uh, process, bioprocessing, what really makes it cool is that you just boil your E. coli and you've got pure enzyme, making the cost of producing the protein virtually nil, virtually nil. Is it be cheaper than making sugar? Cheaper than making protein. sugar. Yes. That's impressive. <laughs> it costs you nothing, almost nothing. So I, I like that thermophile story, and that that's pretty neat that these guys are pulling out uh, enzymes that are uh, used for uh, bioprocessing. And uh, you know that's that's pretty neat. That was a good story. <laughs> yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting story. I love the the term the the bio prospectors. You know, it's like the it it's like prospectors mining for gold, but this time it's it's a different kind of gold. It's enzymatic gold. It's the um, the enzyme that will make it uh, much easier. That the the methods that we use to create bio, biofuels, that we can do them at higher heats, which currently we can't because we don't ha have enzymes that can stand up to higher temperatures. And higher temperatures are better for, uh, for preventing bad bacteria, bad mm -hmm. microbes that contaminate uh, sugar samples to, to grow. So it could make things a lot easier. And like you said, if it's cheap, that's, you know, that's even better. Somebody had a good idea. <laughs> Somebody had a great Somebody. idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So let's um, go. Let's go find those hot springs. Lots of hot springs and look for bacteria. I love it. You know, there are, there are projects where you know people are doing the uh, metagenomics, right? And metagenomics mm -hmm. is uh, they're major projects where you don't try to isolate the organism and find the gene uh, from that organism. You don't try to isolate that organism. What you do is you just take all the living material in an area and you just blast it to all until you have just random DNA and you sequence those genes. So you get a genome for an ecosystem rather than a genome for an individual organism. And they can be really revealing. Um, the, you, you, it, it helps you understand perhaps the interplay of how genes are exchanged cross species. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the big limitations that biotechnology has today is chemistry, right? Having a subset of molecules that we can test for cancer drugs, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, as cancer drugs, anti-tumorals, um, you can go into the soil, harvest just the DNA. You don't even need to get the bacteria. Pop those genes into, you know, individual clones of bacteria of E. coli, and then look for changed chemistry and you basically do uh, chemical metagenomics and then perhaps identify mm -hmm. chemistries that have never been done, life chemistries that haven't been exposed yet and can provide us with new materials to, to test against uh, cystic fibrosis, to test against brain swelling or test against uh, right. cancer. Yeah, I think that the metagenomics is a really interesting uh, tack to take uh, because bacteria in general, a lot of times people uh, or headlines, they'll say back new bacteria never before found. It's not um, that they weren't looking for it in that place, but maybe it's that we didn't have the ability to culture the bacteria. That exactly. Laboratory environments are not necessarily conducive to the growth of bacteria. No, they, they like a pH. They like a, you know, uh, a particular mineral balance. They like, there's mm -hmm. all kinds of, they could, they could, might be feeding off some other bacteria. If you know, if you can't figure out what that other bacteria is, they're not going to grow. But, you know, just thinking about sequencing the human genome, right? You know, we have, how many human cells are there in the human body? 10 trillion? Yeah. Well, there's a hundred trillion bacteria on you. Right. Right. So we're actually more of a meta, a meta organism. Absolutely. Yeah. That's pretty wild stuff. It's scary. You're more bacteria than you are human in terms of number of cells. It's kind of freaky. I love it. I can, now I can just say it's not my fault. It's the bacteria. Absolutely. They made me do it. <laughs> the bacteria made me do it. Yeah, if you're craving uh, some kind of ice cream. You know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So Mark, I don't know much about you personally and your path into science and your interests and how you've gotten to where you are. Um, can you can you tell me a little bit about you know just your journey and how you how you've gotten to where you are? Sure. Um, well, my whole life I've been interested in science. It's been kind of a 
uh, what we watched on TV. It was what we um, we watched David Suzuki in Canada and the nature of things. And um, we read uh, popular science and we read uh, um, National Geographic's anything that was had any science in it. It was uh, quite important in our family. And it, I, I guess that came from uh, the fact that my father was somewhat of a science geek. Mm -hmm. uh, my my great uh, my great aunt was a huge science geek and an influence on our life with respect to science. And uh, so that was the path, and it, it was it was challenging academically. So I've always been one to appreciate a, a, an academic challenge. So I followed through, you know, the general sciences and went to a university uh, and took biology uh, as an undergraduate for undergraduate studies. I have to admit, though, I was uh, on academic probation in my first year. Got a GPA of 1.7. I, I haven't really ever said this on the air, but it took me 19 years of college to recover from that. <laughs> or, or in, at least in my head, put myself in a place that would erase that first horrible year of college. Yeah, um, that, but that's something that I think, you know, a lot of successful scientists, you know, should say out loud. Uh, the first year of college is often very challenging. It's a <laughs> new environment. You're away from home, maybe for the first time. Um, there's so much to sample in terms of interests, uh, new friends. You know, just there's a lot to do. I was <laughs> well, gonna, I also I, there's I there's alcohol and you know fraternities yeah, and things like that. I, too. I didn't drink as an undergraduate. I went through my undergraduate sober, and I was a bar manager at a fraternity, so that doesn't really equate. I was just struggling to get through the sciences, so I I thought right. that having my full capacities was important. Yeah. Um. Uh. But um. Yeah, so I, I, I did manage to <laughs> correct that, that tragic um, academia uh, issue, at least as an undergrad and finished well. Yeah. And by finishing well, that leads you well and uh, leads you into graduate school. So as yeah. you know, you, you want to be successful in your senior undergraduate classes if you're going to take on uh, a master's project. Um, but one thing I did take is in, in junior college, because in Quebec we do a junior college, we did... Um, organic chemistries, but for me it was uh, chimie organique, and I took um, the, the French nomenclature, so uh, so, uh, sodium uh, chlorure de sodium instead of sodium chloride, everything. <laughs> uh, and it, as you know, in organic chemistry, there's a whole language, and yeah. so I went into uh, college, and uh, it was, what? <laughs> I can draw it, wow. but I don't know what you're talking about. So there was a, a little bit of a language issue, but, you know, people overcome that. Um, but from as an undergraduate, and you can tell this from the, the, the people around you uh, studying uh, biology or chemistry, there's going to be a, a subset, a, a group that will, are going to go grab all their stuff. And instead of putting it in a locker somewhere in the, in the university, they're going to find a bench in a lab and just plop their stuff there and say, I'm working here. This is the lab I want to be in and I want to do experiments. And that was what I did is I found a home uh, in a lab and there's that became my home base at the university. I had keys to the greenhouse. I had, I did a lot of plant, it was all plant biotechnology at the start. Right. And uh, so I, from, from the second year, from the, actually from the first time I took plant biology, the first class that I'd taken in biology, I turned around the next semester and TA'd it. So I was very, very aggressive uh, with respect to science in, in college. Did a master's in plant biotech. Um, I thought that I created the first transgenics at the university that I was at, uh, but the, uh, what, what kind of transgenics were you, were you working with? So we were studying genes that, uh, regulate, uh, the tolerance to salt. The pl so plants, if you mm. grow them, take grass and just pour salt on it, they just die. They, they dehydrate. But, uh, if you take wheatgrass, there are certain types of wheatgrass that grow in salt marshes. Salt marshes are, are some of the most productive, uh, bio, uh, um, matter that, that, that can exist in terms of density, biodensity. Um, so we were trying to understand genes that could regulate uh, tolerance to salt stress. So I was taking uh, some kinases that had been isolated in, gene, in, in a, a salt tolerant wheatgrass and putting them to Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a small, um, like fruit fly for plants. Yeah. There's hundreds and thousands of uh, different mutations. And um, then when I realized that after finishing my master's or towards the end of my master's, I didn't want to spend six to eight weeks creating a transgenic. I wanted to be able to study a fundamental biological process, but do recombinant DNA work, 
not in eight weeks, but do it overnight or within a couple of days. So I joined a yeast genetics lab so that we could, I could study a, 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 an advanced eukaryotic cell. Eukaryo we're eukaryotes, so we have a nucleus, uh, uh, an endoplasmic reticulum, a Golgi apparatus, mitochondria. We have organized organi organelles that are yep. organized within a membrane. So are yeast. Brewer's yeast. So I found a great yeast genetics lab. When I first went in there, opened the incubator door and it smelled like bread. <laughs> very, very, very welcoming. And uh, so I, I um, studied protein folding in yeast. And we made uh, versions of uh, both Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is baker's yeast, and Schizosaccharomyces pombi, which is a distant relative of, of cerevisiae. Uh, that has the same protein folding machinery as we do. So uh, we were able to express um, proteins that um, are that result if there's a mutation in uh, disease, human disease, uh, protein folding diseases. So we're able to get yeast to replicate the human cell in folding. And then we could do genetics. It's extremely genetically tractable. You make a mutation, throw it in on a Friday, the gene on Friday, isolate the, uh, the clones on Monday, Tuesday, and you can start studying it. So that's, that's why one of those I, great benefits of, of yeast. It's that life cycle speed. They, they reproduce amazing. so quickly. Oh, you, we, we, um, I did an interview with Malcolm Whiteway, um, who's, a one of the yeast geneticists that teaches a class at Cold Spring Harbor. He was also in the lab. He was a senior um, research scientist with the National Research Council of Canada, and he was in the lab. He had a bench just uh, two benches away from me. Um, I, but I, I brought him on to FIB to talk about it. And, I mean, talking about playing God with life, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, there's nothing you can't do to a yeast uh, right. you, genetically. It's absolutely insane. Um, I, I suppose the next synthetic organism will be a sort of a replica of yeast all made with synthetic chromosomes. But uh, we'll see what Venter does if he, if he makes a synthetic eukaryote. Right. Yeah. So um, I guess that, that was my graduate studies, my PhD. Um, I, then I, I decided to, uh, well, the great thing, and I'm telling this to the audience, the, the, those that are doing their uh, graduate studies, postdocing is an opportunity to travel the world, find a lab that's the best lab in the world, uh, whatever you're interested in, um, do it with a salary so you can, you know, I moved to the U.S., I immigrated to the U.S. and uh, had a salary. Rather, when you're a PhD student, you have to pay tuition. Your, your, your stipend is very, very low. It's very difficult to immigrate to a, a different country or to go at least live in, say, you want to live in Paris for, for five years. Well, postdocing is the perfect opportunity to do this. So I picked uh, New Haven. I wanted to go to Yale. I met a biophysicist that was, he's on track for a Nobel Prize. He has a one in four chance of winning a Nobel Prize for protein folding. Wow. Uh, because he's won all the prizes that lead up to the Nobel Prize. So his last big prize was the Gardner Prize. And statistically, it's a one in four. Um, but here's the situation. I also wanted to start a company and go do the independent um, Edison approach to science rather than the uh, academic approach. A lot of academics uh, are doing fascinating, groundbreaking work. And I've interviewed many uh, on Futures in Biotech, some of the top people in the world who've changed the world. Um, but I prefer the more uh, tangible science that that approaches engineering and that uh, I can feel that I'm making a contribution without having to put too much thought into seeing that contribution. I don't know why. It's just, to me, it has to be translational science and get right. compounds to clinic. Pick a disease and fix it. You know, not yeah. necessarily try to figure out the underpinnings of the disease. So I'll let someone else do that, but I'll take their work from there and, and uh, translate it to clinic. Um, but to do that, right, you need somewhat of a vast, not a vast, but not a deep understanding of everything, but a, a little understanding of everything and a wide coverage. It's kind of like jam. Science is like jam for me, is that the less you have, the more you spread it thin, right? Yeah. <laughs> I can't go into too much detail on any one subject, but I can certainly cover a lot of subjects, which makes it good for futures in biotech too. But I got very, very, very sick in my first year of postdocing. And I'm going to mm -hmm. tell this to your audience. Um, if you're sitting writing a, a fellowship application or a, a, a research paper or a lab report and it's taking a long time, get up and walk around because if you don't, if you pride yourself on the ability to sit down and, and honker through a, like a 40 page paper, you're, you're, you're very, um, you're, ris you're, you're risking getting a, a deep vein thrombosis. And what deep vein thrombosis is a clot in the leg. Mm. 
and that clot can travel to you, to uh, to your lungs and create a pulmonary embolism and mm-hmm. uh, th- kills thirty thousand Americans a year. It, it's a silent killer. And I went to this new lab at Yale. We decided that we'd be applying for this James Hudson Brown uh, fellowship. It's a private fellowship at Yale. Very 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 competitive. And so my son. My firstborn was due the day the fellowship was due. Oh, wow. I would have looked like an idiot sitting there writing my fellowship while my wife is trying to deliver. So I worked yeah, extra Yeah, you, you might be asking for trouble there. <laughs> so I was writing from 8 in the morning till 4 in the morning, eating uh, toast and scrambled eggs, drinking coffee. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, drink, eating scrambled eggs and eating um, and drinking coffee. So that's what I did. And it was, so it was like a, almost a 20-hour uh, session day after day after day to get this fellowship out early so that I, I would be there for my son's birth. Sometimes I, I think that uh, academic lifestyle is a bit of, of extremophile living. It is. Well, here's the, <laughs> what, here's, what, we, what you subject yourself to to get things done, but go ahead. Here's a crazy story. The, the, uh, I, when I w- joined this lab, they told me that someone in, in Sandra's lab, the neighboring lab, a person died. And I was like, why did a young person die? Then uh, they said that while he went to the Yale Health Plan clinic and he sat there and he just keeled over and died. He was writing the same fellowship I was writing. Oh, my goodness. He got a DVT, went to his lungs and died. Um, I had the same thing happen to me, except uh, it got stuck in my heart because I had a hole in my heart. It's called a PFO. A lot of people have it. One in five people have it. But mine trapped this clot that was the size of a garter snake. And I could still walk. I could not walk upstairs, though. I'd get winded from walking upstairs. I walked, uh, so I wrote the, the, the application, delivered it to the third floor of the genetics department, uh, hit the floor, coughed up blood, stood up, walked over to the secretary's office, handed it to her, went back, got a drink of water, and went home for a week. Um, <laughs> so I got very, very sick. And uh, here's yeah. how it contributed to my science training. My uh, mentor decided, well... He wanted to go to Scripps. All his buddies were going to Scripps. All his Nobel Prize friends, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner friends, were going to Scripps. So he wanted to start a lab at Scripps and go from the East Coast to the West Coast. All my medical doctors, you know, my uh, hematologist, my cardiologist, my surgeon, they were all in New Haven. I didn't want to leave. So I said to him, well, I've, I've just spent a year learning biophysics. I want to extend my training and continue in the field of cryo-electron microscopy. So I'm going to join the younger lab and just move down the hall. And he went nuts. He just went ballistic, throwing everything he could at me with, with like very disturbing language in public, in outside at the lunch carts. It was hor- he sent me an apology, letter of apology, which I will frame once he wins the Nobel Prize, <laughs> if he wins. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> so I switched labs. I had to bounce labs, and then I got to this lab. It was a very poorly funded lab, very difficult, but it was doing the science I wanted to do. But ran out of, that lab ran out of money. That person, that professor left and went to Northwestern. And then I joined the physiology lab. So I went from a genetics biophysics lab to a, um, a, an imaging lab, uh, which was doing a cryo-electron microscopy, then to a physiology lab, excuse me, and spent two years, uh, almost two years in, in these three different departments, which gives you a good background for running a company. Because it gives you, again, that scientific background yep. that's spread out. Very broad and integrated. It, it will not get you an academic position because you right. haven't set to get a, uh, a long string of publications in a specific field to make that significant contribution. You have to stay in put for five years. That's why yeah. PhDs take five, about five years. You can make that significant contribution. So, um, but that fit well with my overall strategy of starting a company and uh, doing translational research. So throughout that time, throughout my postdoc, I always kept o- my eyes open for a project that could um, lead to a, uh, a significant um, uh, unmet medical need, something that could uh, challenge, or not challenge, but fix a major unmet medical need. And that's how I came uh, across um, brain swelling. So, um, but to, go ahead. I was just going to say, so, so on this note, um, I have to take a brief break to get uh, to have a word from our sponsor Netflix and when we return I want to find out from Mark um, more about what his company does 
in the area of studying cerebral edema and uh, how to solve that problem molecularly. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to your TV, PC, or Mac, or iPad, or, you know, just about any other thing you can use to watch it. And it streams it instantly, which means you save time, money, and hassle. That's good. There are several easy ways to instantly access the streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. So you can watch them on your Mac PC or iPad or even iPhone and some Android phones as well. Uh, Xboxes, PS3s, Nintendo Wiis, those gaming consoles are great too. If you're not a gamer, you can watch Netflix on your TV with an Apple TV box or a Roku box. They're pretty inexpensive and very easy to use. And with Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly with any of these devices, any of them. And you can begin watching a movie or a show on one device, stop watching it, and then finish watching on a completely different device. It remembers where you are. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies or TV shows as you want any time you want. The catch there is any time you want, which is pretty freeing. And you can cancel any time. The offer that Netflix is giving to you is for you to try Netflix today for 30 days for free. That's right. 30 days, one month, absolutely free. All you have to do is go to Netflix, N-E-T-F-L-I-X dot com forward slash twit. And be sure to use this URL when you sign up for your free trial, Netflix dot com forward slash twit. We thank Netflix.com for their support of Twit and Dr. Kiki Science Hour. And we hope that you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. And now back to the show. This is Dr. Kiki Science Hour. We are speaking with Dr. Mark Pelletier, the host of Futures in Biotech. This is the Futures in Biotech Science Hour mashup. And Mark, before the break, was just telling us about his path to where he has gotten. And um, at this point in time, he is uh, he has a company that he is working independently to uh, solve problems related to brain swelling or cerebral edema. Mark, um, can you keep going with the story and kind of, sure. and, and tell us, <laughs> the, tell me how you're doing what you're doing. What is the, uh, the, I guess, the translational aspect? How are you putting the science into application? Sure. I'd, I'd, I'd kind of like to say that, you know, one of the reasons why I do the Futures in Biotech thing is that it gets me the opportunity to talk to people that are making major changes in in the in the human existence even, you know, through medicine or through our, their better understanding of who we are, right, at the molecular level. And uh, there was a colleague, he was a, well, more than a colleague, he was a, a professor at, at Yale in the genetics department. He's now the, the chairman. I think he's still the chairman. His name is R Richard Lifton. And he applied recombinant cloning or not recombinant cloning techniques old-fashioned fruit fly genetics to the human uh, to humans basically and he said mm -hmm. well there's how many how many uh, genomes are there out there in the on earth there's 13 billion genomes right because right. we, we carry two so he went out and sought families that had uh, incredible incredible hypertension kids 18 year olds with hypertension that was so high that it would be off the wall and then uh, looked for you know, did recombinational uh, mapping, you know, the classic fruit fly where if you have uh, an offspring, you should have Mendelian, if you have offspring, you should have a Mendelian distribution of, uh, you know, uh, of genes. If you look at corn, you'll have, you know, three yellow and one dark or whatever, or, or you know, pea pods or tall or short pea pods or whatever. Um, so he used, uh, you know, classical genetics to humans for trying to understand hypertension. And he found out that hypertension which is the number one killer on earth, right? One in five chance yeah. of dying. If you're actually, it's, yeah, one in five, there's statistics, one in five or, you know, um, yeah, in cardiovascular disease, it's one in 2.9, right? Chances of dying. But so um, hypertension, those uh, one in five. So uh, we're looking at affecting you know, on terms of the current earth's population. There's three generations, maybe five, 600 million people 
that are affected. And by cl cloning the genes for hypertension, he identified these genes to be proteins that were expressed in the kidney. Then they realized that uh, it's basically a, a problem of salt, right, hypertension, not being able to balance salt. And it changed how people uh, use diuretics and then started to use them to treat hypertension. So it, basically his science led to saving about 100 million lives, right? Some could argue that, well, it was him and, and a few colleagues, and, but it's his, his gene cloning and then the follow-up work of his colleagues and uh, competitors as well led to saving 100 million lives. Is there anything better that you could potentially do? You know, there's people that cause yeah. wars that kill, uh, you know, 50 to 100 million people, but to really have a situation where you're saving 100 million lives... So for all those that are interested in science, go pick a disease and fix it or go do something great. But so I, I <laughs> Just, use, it's that I, simple. It's that simple. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I'm sitting there at Yale and uh, there, in the physiology department, there's an invited guest speaker. And it's, it's amazing how much this happens, actually. This is freaky. Uh, so you're standing there listening to a talk and the individual is going on and on, giving beautiful detail work saying, well, here's, there's a gene, right? And it codes for a water channel. And water channel, of course, brain swan, um, this water channel is positioned in astrocytes. Okay, and let me explain a little bit at the molecular level. It should be fairly easy to, to get because I get it. So 90% uh, of your brain is made up of feeder cells. They're called glial cells. They feed neurons, and that's why you only use 10% of your brain. And the major glial cell is called an astrocyte. Now, astrocyte comes from the Greek astiri or star, so it's, it's shaped like a star. So it reaches out and there's strands and the, the, uh, it stretches out and so I'm going to do it here, grabs a capillary. So it's a star shaped cell that has um, end feet that go and grab a capillary. So you can imagine a tube. I'm trying to do it with a video. So here's a capillary tube and an astrocyte going to grab it. At, that, the, at the face of the astrocyte, 40% is made up of a single protein that is so dense that it forms chain mail. It forms a two-dimensional crystal lattice, and it's a water channel. And you might ask, well, why does 90% of your brain express a water channel so densely that it forms a crystal lattice? Why do you have so much? Why is your brain a better? And that, that protein is related to what you have in your kidney to reabsorb water. Uh, um, from your collecting duct. So if you, if you want to concentrate urine, this is, and your kidney does a lot of this, 180 liters of blood is filtered a day. Why is your brain capable of possibly even filtering 200 liters of, of blood a day because of all this water channel? Um, that remains to be answered. Okay, <laughs> but here's the problem. This, this scientist was saying, well, we knocked the gene out of mice and we gave them a stroke, middle cerebral artery occlusion. They basically throw a little clot to the middle cerebral artery. Uh, an ischemic part of the brain uh, happens where there's a lack of oxygen. They develop a stroke, but these guys, their brains don't swell. They, they decide to inject them with water. They take 20% of the mass of the mouse and inject it with water, which is kind of like swallowing 20 liters of water and drowning. You, you, it was a 60 minutes piece where they found that these kids were falling in pools, having near-death experiences, drowning, but coming out then going home and then just dying. So because they'd had too much water. Yeah, water toxicity. Yeah. Um, uh, meningitis, your brain swells. So they, knocked, they, they tested all these models in mice where they'd knocked out the gene and the, the mice were fine. They doubled their survival. So I'm sitting here there listening to this talk. I'm thinking, that's brilliant. Cool. 2003 Nobel Prize was given to Peter Agre for this. And this uh, person had identified the, 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 the one that was in the brain. And uh, s some scientists had all looked at these various models and published saying, well, if we knock it out, we, 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 we're going to save my mice lives. And I'm there. Well, has anybody done any screening for drugs for humans? He said, no. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, why not? <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the state of the science, right? So I said to my, uh, my postdoc mentor at the time, let's form a company and let's make some drugs to prevent brain swelling. Um, if you think about it, there's 700,000 people in the U.S. this year. I, I, I know the statistics for the U.S. You could, by population size, extrapolate it to the rest of the world. 700,000 that will have a stroke this year um, in the U.S. I think 100 and 200,000 will have a reoccurrent stroke. Um, so there's a lot of new strokes, maybe 500,000 new strokes. Then you have uh, uh, 235,000 hospitalizations because of brain trauma from car accidents, from sports injuries. 
um, with 50,000 dead. Uh, there's a person dying every, uh, or having a stroke at least every three to four minutes. Um, so it's a major, major problem. And what have you have you ever watched uh, Grey's Anatomy? I'm sure you have. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's a deep, well, at least at the early years. So at one point, there's <laughs> an ambulance that flips over. <laughs> an ambulance flips over, and uh, the the ambulance driver um, has a, a massive head trauma, and Doctor Grey is stuck in the ambulance in the passenger seat. So uh, he's starting to get go into convulsions because his brain is swelling. They hand her a drill. She drills the, the, the driver in the skull to relieve intracranial pressure. That's what people do. That's what doctors do. They remove its craniectomy. It's the only thing that really works. And it doesn't even work that well. You take the, the, a piece of the skull off and you, you insert it into the abdomen. It just so gives the brain room? room to swell so that it's not pushing against the brain case. Exactly. So yeah. is, that, is that modern medicine? No, that's so, like leeches. <laughs> it's, well, it's, it actually works. So. Which leeches, leeches work too. To work, yeah, leeches work too for certain things, yes. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, so here's a situation where um, we understand uh, there's a genetic proof of concept for a drug target that could potentially save two to 300,000 Americans a year and uh, no one working on it. So I formed a, a small LLC which all you do is go to the Secretary of State's office in your state and you pay $25 to register, or maybe $50, and you form an LLC. You go to uh, uh, a number of you know, sort of business entity registrations like the Duns and Bradshaw. You go to uh, the IRS. They like to know that you're there. Get an EIN number, an employee identification number. You register with grants.gov and you can apply for a business grant. Not an academic grant, but a business grant. And this is a grant that goes into your bank account, not into the university's bank account. Yeah. And if you put a good scientific uh, proposal together uh, with a major problem being tackled that has a solid commercialization plan, uh, you'll get funded. So I asked, you, typically they give 150000 for a six-month project. But um, the NIH, some agencies like the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke know that you can't do anything for 150000 in six months. It's just not, uh, it's not even reasonable. So I asked for 900000 for two years. <laughs> and they, my reviewers said, are you insane? And then they gave me six hundred. So I was able to nice. actually get a research program going. Um, but I have to admit, uh, that's still not a lot of money for medical research. No, uh, for the first year, I was alone in the lab. Um, so just setting up a lab, paying for the overhead, uh, I, it didn't leave a lot of money in paying for the chemistry and paying for the... I did some subcontract work uh, to screen. I didn't buy the robotics in my first year. And um, so, you know, it was late nights, only person there. And if I wanted the grant to get renewed to the next phase, which is significantly larger because this a phase one would be a certain amount. Your phase two would be about five times that amount because if you're successful in your first phase, you go on to the next stage of development and uh, managed to pull that in. Uh, now we're four full-time uh, uh, scientists on the bench and seven part-timers. Nice. And yeah, so now we're, 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 you know, so you have this water channel in your brain. We're just trying to block it. And we screen. We, I, uh, I started off by engineering cells that would have that water channel, but that are easy to grow. These are cancerous Chinese hamster ovary cells. Nice. And <laughs> they grow. They grow up your arm, you know, and they're easy to manipulate genetically. And they, they act like a mammalian cell. So they respond well to drug that would be a drug that would work in humans. If you screened in frog eggs, you might get a drug that will work in frog eggs, but it won't work in a mammalian cell. So we, right. I, I wanted to start off on a better foot. And uh, we screened uh, at the first uh, point 20,000 uh, compounds to see which ones would modulate swelling. Uh, we just shocked the cells with water. And if you have a water channel, you're going to swell and pop. So I looked for drugs that would prevent cells from popping. As simple as that and uh, identified seven molecules and um, we've been developing them. We spent the next, last year and a half taking it from the screen, going into validation experiments and uh, developing structure activity uh, relationships. How does that protein and that drug fit together? 
how do the electron density clouds interact? How does the, uh, are the hydrogen bonding to these two atoms? You know, how does it work? And you do this through uh, iterations and iterations of testing analogs that are very closely related to your molecule. Um, I've recruited a crystallographer that is fantastic, one of the best in the world, if not the best in the world. He was at Yale for 16 years on the bench working for that uh, mentor of mine that was the first, my first lab at Yale um, and brought him close to the Nobel Prize. Now he's, he was from Cleveland, so I said, you want to come back to Cleveland? He said, absolutely. And uh, okay. so now he gets to do, uh, you know, um, crystallography of this brain protein and mix it in with the drugs that I identified in the screen. And, uh, you know, we go out to Chicago to the particle accelerator, shoot the, 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 the proteins with uh, x-rays and solve their atomic structure. And that gives you an idea of which atoms to change to improve the strength of that interaction. If you were given a drug, you don't want to take a horse pill. You want to take a little pill. <laughs> right. So the way that happens is it's got to be extremely potent. This, potent is really, as, this is really interesting also for you talking about taking a pill. And, and one issue with drugs for brain problems, diseases, other things, it is crossing the blood-brain barrier. But here you're actually affecting the blood-brain barrier. Exactly. So you don't have to cross it necessarily. You just have to no. touch it on the outside. And it'll probably be slightly damaged at the point of injury, right? Yeah. So you're, you're looking at a, a less difficult situation. Also, the patients, this is from a commercialization standpoint, how quickly you get to market. Um, if you don't have to go through the GI tract, uh, you don't have to design a pro-drug that gets processed by your, the enzymes in your gut and then sent into your bloodstream. Uh, our patients are going to be people arriving on an, on an ambulance, in an ambulance for the most part, verified whether or not they have a, a bleeding stroke or a clot stroke. And then they'll be put on an IV and given our drug immediately. Being on IV, that saves a lot of uh, issues with respect to designing a molecule that's, that's on target, that... Um, it has a rapid action that you can keep adding so that you can put a little bit higher doses if you need to, um, easier to control. So uh, mm -hmm. it's a very elegant um, strategy for us. I mean, we're lucky that that would be the situation. Although I do want to make a drug um, that every senior citizen in the country could take, including myself, uh, that would prevent brain from swelling during... Um, a stroke, right? So if I have a yeah. stroke, I don't want my brain to swell. And I want to be that mouse that has the gene knocked out. Well, I'm not going to go get gene therapy in my brain to knock <laughs> it out. Most people are not <laughs> going to do that. Yeah. No? Well, you can take a small pill, like mm -hmm. a small baby aspirin that will go and hit that water channel and stay there. And, um, you know, this, this could be very, it could improve survival from stroke uh, twofold. So out of the 700,000 people that will have stroke and the 150, 100 to 200,000 that will die, you might save 100,000 lives, right, by taking this prophylactic uh, anti-edema drug. Not to yeah. mention soldiers, right, that, that suffer a brain trauma from blast overpressure from IEDs that go off. So soldiers could take this prophylactically or they could take it, um, they're, they're, you know, themselves, self-administration or their, their medic in the field could give it to them. Um, so hopefully we're going to make not only super soldiers, but super seniors. <laughs> <laughs> I love that super seniors. How, what are the challenges that you're up against? Um, I mean, you know, how realistically the drug, it seems like that the technique is very elegant and that the, the likelihood of finding, uh, finding the drug, um, is it, it's very high, but in terms of your time frame and the challenges to actually get there, what are you looking at? Sure, there, there's a, an extreme. There's a, there are extreme challenges. Um, on the one side, non-scientific, there's the, the the amount of capital that's out there for us to access. Um, right now, with four people in the lab, we spend a hundred thousand a month. I have to find a hundred thousand a month to keep this going. Yeah. And I'm on, I'm on, I don't have a, a university paying my salary. So I've got to pay my salary out of that and everybody's salary out of that. So, um, capital, there has to be, the country has to be in a position of wealth to be able to take some of that wealth to invest it in high risk ventures. Um, you have to protect the intellectual property such that you can leverage that intellectual property to raise that, that capital, right? Th mm -hmm. These are this is how you get science done, right? To get it out into the world. Yeah. Um, for example, 
if I were to patent these molecules, I would be drawing the structure, sending it to the U.S. Patent Office. All my competitors would say, oh, this is where they're at. They've got a molecule working at 10 micromolar, and this is a structure. Well, I'm going to take that structure, start working on derivatives, till I'm off the patent, and improve on it. So yeah. you can't publish or patent. You, so, and if it gets out, you're toast. So make sure that nobody can read that post. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking it with my head. Yeah. Um, can't so see it's it got to be extremely secret. This is the Coke uh, um, the Coke, Coke model Pepsi of, thing. of know-how, yeah. yeah, of know-how, but not intellectual property. And that intellectual property has to, has to be so valuable that you can raise between four, eight, four and eight hundred million dollars to get through phase three clinical trials. Yeah, right. You have to pay everybody's hospital bill, and you might do a clinical trial with fifty thousand patients. Right. So you're gonna you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars that you have to raise based on the hope that this will work. So the country has to be in a position where there's lots of capital and people are investing. So um, that's, a, that's a huge challenge. Will I be able to do it? Will we get over the, the, the valley of death with respect to early stage research and complete doability, right? That's why we're going after the crystal structure. It'll improve our doability. So that's one of the technical challenges is getting these proteins to line up and for, like cars in a parking lot. You know, cars, they're all over the place. But when they sit in a parking lot, they're all facing an organized structure. And then you can sh throw an x-ray beam. And then by the, the way that the x-rays diffract, you can reverse that with a computer algorithm and find out how the cars were actually parked and what the cars look like. That's mm -hmm. an extremely difficult challenge with the membrane protein. Don't forget, ours is sitting in the membrane of the astrocyte end foot grabbing a capillary. It's a membrane protein. So um, membrane proteins... Um, are difficult because the only way you can get them purified is you coat them with a detergent. That detergent creates a, a new chemical environment that is not like its native form inside the brain. So you've right. got to make sure the drug is not binding to the lipid, uh, to the to the detergent. Sorry. Detergent, yeah. It's it's hitting the target, the ligand, the exact atoms that are true to its inhibition that as it's behaving in our cells. Because it works in our cells, does it work in the biochemical level? Those are huge, huge challenges to show that a drug is working on target. There's a lot of drugs. I hit the market where they still don't know what the target is. And I take Coumadin, mm -hmm. and Coumadin, and I think it was 2004, 2005, they realized it was a vitamin K inhibitor. Um, so to improve my chances of, of raising money, I want to get to that mechanism of action, to know what atoms are involved. And we're almost there. We've got the crystals. We're down to four angstroms. We're, we're heading out to the synchrotron in Chicago, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get the picture. Um, so that's one of the the largest technical challenges, um, pharmacogenetics, finding a system yeah. where you can do rapid genetic mutations to test whether or not the model that's on the crystal side is legit, right? Because you can be doing an experiment with all the proper controls in the lab, but there's a missing piece of the picture that you didn't see and it took you down the wrong road. So there are huge, huge technical challenges. We bang our heads on the wall, and every so often, when we take a step back, we come up with a solution and uh, we take it to the next stage. And uh, you, hopefully we keep moving forward and don't hit a, 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 a block. One of the things I want to do, because um, we're working on the physiology of water in the brain, and these water channels are, are there's uh, 12 of them. There's, they're called aquaporins. We have some in our kidney. We have some in our lungs. We have some in our red blood cells. They're all over the place. Um, the kidney, uh, you know, there's a drug called Lasix, right? And yeah. if you've got liver uh, cirrhosis or um, heart failure, um, I think it's 66% of people that have heart failure. Uh, and heart failure kills uh, one in three. Um if you could prevent them from swelling, uh, many people have seen this in family members that have had heart failure, they swell up. If you could prevent, if you could cause them to have a syndrome where they, they uh, get rid of water, um, like there, there's a disease called diabetes insipidus, where they just lose water and they have to drink all day long. Well, if you could activate that, and that's what Lasix does, but Lasix does it by messing around with ions, right? Uh, there's sodium chloride, uh, sodium potassium chloride channels. Um, in the kidney. What if you could just block the water? Why do you have to go after an indirect pathway? Why don't you just block the water? And there's, a, there's the water channel in the kidney that if we block it, it would result in the inability to concentrate urine and it would allow you to just lose water and uh, lose that biomass, or not biomass, but the, the, the weight, the water weight. So I want to leverage what we're doing with the brain swelling 
to a new uh, class of diuretics that would be on target um, and a direct pharmacological approach and to raise a, a new s set of funding in case the brain swelling fails for technical reasons. Right? So. Yeah. It's always good to have multiple, multiple targets, multiple places that you can take the research that you're going so that you're not putting your, all your eggs in one basket. You learn that as a PhD student. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, we have we've raced through this hour. This has been fascinating for me to, to hear your story and to, to hear how you're approaching your science and, and what you're doing. And I think it, the, your story is a really good, a really good tale of of the practical nature of science and how you know how how it gets done how how work gets done that gets a drug to to your medicine cabinet um so this has been just fascinating um for you mark futures in biotech is you know the the program that you do here on the twit network what do we have to look forward to in the next couple of, of, of shows? What are you looking forward to in, uh, in your program coming up? Well, um, I don't plan them that far ahead. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> uh, we have tomorrow Mark Gerstein, who's a bioinformatician at Yale, who is setting up the informatics, who sets up the informatics frameworks for all the major genomics projects, all the big genetics projects, including uh, the human proteome, which is not genetics, but it's biochemistry, but it's a billion dollar project. And he sets up the computational framework to get through it. He's really, really, really uh, one of the brightest individuals I know. And uh, he even wants, he has a piece. He's been doing some work that's very relevant to security now. So we're going to try and leapfrog him off of futures in biotech into security now um, for biosecurity. You know, hmm. how do you... Uh, you know, the TSAs, do, do they, should they do a swab or not? Yeah. You know, there's all kinds of um, ways that you, you could manipulate genetics or, or use genetics to, uh, to determine um, identity and, and then how to block identity theft. I always wondered what it'd be like to, you know, if, if to do uh, foren forensic jamming, right? To get hired right. as a forensic jammer. But I, I work on the legitimate side of the science. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he's coming on. Um, and then uh, the following week, we have Beju Shaw. Now, Beju was a Yale undergrad, Harvard Law grad. Um, bright, bright, bright guy. He, um, what he did is he came to Cleveland and the Cleveland Clinic, the number one heart hospital in the world, is sitting right there. Case Westerns uh, and the UH hospitals are just down the street. And there's no momentum to create uh, industry here in the world field of biotech and health uh, research. So he started an incubator and he's pushed um, 70 to 80 companies through the process of uh, funding and has raised, helped them raise, I think, 800 to a billion dollars and created a corridor of life science research here um, uh, it, right between Cleveland Clinic and, uh, and Case Western. Just to give you an example, my lab, my bench, sorry, when I was in New Haven, all I could afford is a bench because I moved across the street from Yale. I could afford a bench. It cost 2500 a month. Here in Cleveland, under his, in his business incubator, I have 1,600 square foot lab and about 1,000 foot feet worth of office space, actually a little bit more. Uh, for $2,500. So uh, he's going to be coming up in two weeks. And so it's going to be a little bit more of a business show, but it's, um, it's going to be a biotech business show. And hopefully we're going to then cover some synthetic biology. Uh, Always fun. Synthetic biology, it's, they're, they're kind of wacko. <laughs> yeah, I think it's they're like great. It's hard to see a point to it. But then again, why would you go explore the, universe, uh, the solar system, right? Why would you send a human around Neptune? Yep. I think it, it has to be done. It had, so, it, where do we need to take it? Yes. Yeah. And if anybody thinks, you know, that, you know, I've done, uh, I think about 85 shows and I've had, you know, Nobel laureates. I've had, um, well, I had one fellow, Mario Capecchi, what a great story. He, during the second world war, he was a child in Italy. His mother gave up, uh, sold everything she had, gave the money to a, a neighboring family. He lived with them. And then she went to prison for, because she was a, an anti-fascist and he, the money ran out after a year he ended up for six years as a homeless child in the streets of Rome 
I took and had never taken a bath during the entire year eating toast and coffee beans. And then uh, he, fin- he finally moved to his uncle's house in the U.S., did his Ph.D. with James Watson and won the Nobel Prize for inventing the genetically engineered mouse. Ooh, wow. That, uh, that was a Futures in Biotech episode, I think, 62 you know, I, I've That's been awesome. l- by Leo ag- agreeing to do futures in biotech has given me an opportunity to fish out some of the most incredible stories. Uh, yeah. And you know, we're witnessing um, a dramatic change in the human existence. I've done, I think, seven shows on life extension, starting five years ago with Leonard Grant, who discovered the first genes that. Uh, if activated, could extend lifespan in the model organisms that they, they were testing. They did it in yeast, for, first of all. I, I, so five years ago, they identified the sirtuins. Since then, a company was formed across the street from MIT, and it sold for $700 million to GlaxoSmithKline. And what they're, they're in phase three clinical trials with the activators of the sirtuin family of genes uh, for diabetes, cancer, and Alzheimer's. Their goal, since the FDA doesn't consider death a disease, they're looking right. at delaying the onset of age-related diseases. So basically extending the lifespan of these individuals in this phase three clinical trial. Back five years ago, he said, um, it's, it's part of the musical theme of Futures in Biotech. He, he talks about it, Leo asks him, and how many years will it take? Uh, I think he said five years. So they're, they're about to go, you know, take it to FDA-approved drug. And if you take this drug, you have a likelihood of extending your lifespan between 15 and 20 years. So anybody who can afford it, the males will have an average lifespan expand from, what is it, in, in the U.S., 77 years old to 95, 96. That'll be the average. So the number of centenarians, is that, is that what they call them? Septa- Cent- septagenarians. Yeah, sept- yeah, 100-year-old people will quadruple. Yeah. Think of what's going to happen to Social Security. Um, yeah, not we, that that's the biggest problem, but <laughs> God, think about it. Uh, that's only the. You know, I've interviewed Cynthia Kenyon, who managed to get a worm, which is a, an animal, to live five times longer, and we have those same genes. That means we're going to live to five hundred years. Uh, there's just some great. Uh, Gordon Lithgow was on a, a show. Uh, was it the two shows ago? He he put a paper in Nature that that found a link between the state of protein folding and life extension. And I'm reading the paper and saying, well, this is all fine and dandy, but, but the drug is working at 50 micromolar, which means you would have to take a bucket of drug. But yeah. down further in the paper, he has two drugs that are structurally related that are working at 50,000 times more potent. They're already clinical candidates. They're already yeah. potent enough to be, but he never mentions it in the paper. All he says is, well, this yellow dye. <laughs> he's, he's, he's keeping that to himself. He's, he's not putting no, he's that not out even there. I asked him and he brought <laughs> it out. He had to bring it out. He couldn't, he couldn't keep it quiet. But, you know, he, he, so there's, there, there's I've, I've had an incredible, uh, great fortune to, to talk to some amazing people. I had um, Harrison Absolutely. Schmidt, the last man to walk on the moon, describe what it was like to, to walk in the valley of Taurus Littrow on the moon. Um, and that's thanks to the, the Twit Network. So uh, thanks, Leo, if you're listening. I uh, really appreciate it. And there'll be many more shows like this. I've had the chief engineer of the command module, the guy who helped save the lives of Apollo 13. He was 30 years old. He had 1,000 engineers working for him. And they designed everything from how do you go from 20,000 degrees to 200 degrees across a heat shield on the command module. You know, so... Uh, that's what the yeah. people have to expect, I guess, from Futures in Biotech. That's what I'm going to try to do is at least keep it at that level. Uh, the past few shows, maybe awesome. the past five or six shows, I was very, very sick. And I was struggling through each show, you know, with abdominal pain. I know that. I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. And, and that resolves yeah. itself. Now you're doing it without sleep, which is... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Trying to keep like the challenge. brain moving. That's the challenge yes. these days. <laughs> Mark, you've done some amazing work on futures in biotech. The it's a, always an interesting show. It's um, I, I find the the content of the programs stimulating, and you know it, it lead me to want to ask more questions and to you know inquire more into the subjects. So it's uh, I hope that other people will check it out and and find it find the interest there i think you know you ask the ask some great questions and get some great guests unfortunately we're at the end of the show so we have to go but this has been wonderful 
Mark Pelletier, thank you very much for joining me here on the Science Hour. Anybody who is interested, uh, you can check out Futures in Biotech if you go to futuresinbiotech.com. That's the blog website. Um, you can also just access it easily through the Twit TV website. Mark, thank you very much for a really interesting hour. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Oh, thank you. And, and keep up the great work with the broadcasting. It's fantastic. Keep Thank up the you. science. Keep keep pushing the science. We need to educate the next generation. We we need a we need a strong group of uh, scientists. That's following right. us. That's right. Push <laughs> so the push the science envelope. Let's inspire interest for the future. Thank you, everybody, for watching. This has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki, and you can catch this show online if you haven't seen this live. You're probably listening to it somewhere or watching it somewhere. But, you know, if you want to know those places where you can catch past episodes, you can go to twit.tv forward slash Kiki. Um, it's, we're also available in iTunes. You can watch past episodes uh, in YouTube in the twit channel there's a uh, we're, we're in there in the twit channel and um i think that's about it i'll be back next week with more science to cover we have lots more science for the summertime and i'll be bringing it bringing it to you every thursday from 4 to 5 p.m pacific time once again thank you very much for joining me this hour and all i ask is one hour a week i do hope that it makes your world a whole lot more interesting 